Titter will do this soon. It's working. Should we wait for Jamal to close the... Was that a timer? Is that timer actually going to run? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Do we take a quick selfie? Oh, he's taking a break, apparently. Yeah. Oh, great. That's right, there you go. Gotta show off the t-shirt. All right, seems like we can go ahead and get started. So I'm Andy Gospodaric. Yeah, I'm, I'm Jesper. And uh, I'm with Broadcom, Jesper's with Red Hat. Uh, we're here just kind of talking about uh, an XTP application that we've worked on. Uh, Jesper laid down the framework. Um, I had a really similar interest, uh, so in a true open source way, I abandoned all the code I was writing and just started hacking on his. Uh, and so we've got a sample application, uh, full, yeah. full, full source available. Uh, we, were, we, were, we were both uh, motivated by, like, we, we, we sat down and looked at this, EPF, this, this BPF stuff, and it was... It was, it was quite hard to like figure out, so we thought maybe it's other people also like have have a hard time getting getting started with using BPF, and so we we, we sat down and said, okay, let's let's try to make this a little bit easier. Right. Write a sample application. Now we want to, now, to, and to we're, teach people. Right? So that's, <laughs> that's right. And we're willing to share it with you, no matter how bad it is. Uh, we both joked about how bad we are at user interfaces. So. Yeah. Uh, you can laugh, it's fine. Um, well, so some of the other motivation too, you know, XTP is still pretty new, uh, despite there being a lot of talks about it at the conference and other places. Uh, it's been a popular net dev topic for a while. Um, but a lot of the discussion is focused around uh, like data center use cases or, you know, often with expensive NIC, NIC hardware or, you know, pretty beefy processors. Um, but there's also obviously a lot of benefits to DDoS prevention on uh, lower, lower end systems, uh, maybe not the most expensive thing you can find. Um, and Thankfully, uh, there's alternative hardware that supports x86 and ARM, and so we had a chance to uh, demonstrate uh, both, of those, both of those architectures and some of the NICs that are available there. Uh, the other goal, too, is to think about there's a pretty limited set right now of uh, drivers that have support. Um, so maybe, hopefully, if you're, if you're a driver maintainer and you're not thinking about it, you can start thinking about it. Yeah. So. As, as, as you can see here, uh, we put the example code up on, on GitHub because this is basically what everybody does today, right? They, they find some, <coughs> some example code on GitHub and just git clones this and, <laughs> and, and run it without like checking anything, right? So, so this, is, this is basically the model. So they, they have to run the program as root, but then people, I guess people just run stuff. People just seem to enjoy yeah. running anything so, from GitHub. So people so. just want a quick like, sample code that just works. So that's what we try to do, just put it out there and people can download the stuff and see what, what happens. That's right. So initially what we've got support for is uh, sort of a non-interactive program. So it runs and runs in the background, uh, which is the case with everything XTP. But there's no user interface program that runs uh, at, at the same time right now. It sort of differentiates it from some of the in-kernel in -kernel tree programs right now. Uh, it filters on source IP address and destination UDP and or TCP ports. Um, yeah. so, so it's, it's basically the most simple like blacklist 
implementation. Right. So it's that's, as that's also to keep it simple, the use case is not an advanced denial of service prediction, detection me mechanism. It's just really simple, like you would block your in normal IP tables. This also makes it comparable like to IP tables if you just drop a, Right. A, just a single, single command to yeah. add something or single command comparison. to remove something so, from the list. Um, so just kind of as a, as a little uh, demonstration of the output, uh, you have a few IP addresses and the, the data after it is blocked, um, a few ports and the, the protocol and the drop traffic from each one. Um, Jesper and I are debating as to whether or not this is valid JSON. Uh, we don't. I, I think we're going to change the, the yeah. JSON a bit we, here. We, but, we have but to work on this a little bit, but uh, either way. Um, sort of the idea that this should also be machine parsable, uh, any of the output you have, if you want to quickly, quickly figure that out. So we sort of baked that in from the start. Um, and also, we've got some uh, real-time stats that are available, uh, kind of very similar to the stuff that, that's happened before. This is just a random um, small sample I had on, on a, a system. Um, so clearly, the number of packets that are being dropped and the number that are passing. So we've got a couple, a couple frames uh, what, what, in this one. What, what, what kind of system is this? Uh, this was a, like a low-end x86. Okay. Nothing, nothing too crazy, um, and just a simple ten, uh, low end ten gig NIC. Um, nothing, nothing new or fancy. Explain what. The, the, the numbers are a little bit too the low here. What's the NIC? What was the NIC? The NIC. What was the NIC? Uh, in this case, this was a, um, a Broadcom NIC driven by the BNXT driver. It supports X, XDP already. Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thanks. I think we have a slide on what's when it's got yeah, supported. Yeah, I do. Okay, so that's just a little, a little taste of what we're talking about. Um, so, uh, so now we'll kind of get started. There's been a lot of, I want to burn through these beginning slides, but I did want to provide a little bit of just kind of fundamentals on XDP or eBPF just for those uh, watching from home. Or uh, realistically, the funny part is there's so many, these slides will appear online. We sort of felt like it was good to put a little bit of extra information in there uh, for people that read this after the fact. Um, so BPF is old, circa 1992. EBPF, a uh, little bit newer, circa 2014. Um, so the programs are small. They have restrictions. I don't want to go into all the details. I think it was even discussed yesterday, so people probably know 4K instructions, uh, lots of other things. Um, and the primary interaction with the outside world is a, sort of a generic key value store uh, that people refer to as an EBPF map. And by the way, I'm going to say, try not to say EBPF too much because it's amazingly kind of a mouthful. So if I say BPF, just know it's the same. Um, and there's a whole bunch of different key store uh, like map types, um, at least a dozen right now. It's pretty regularly growing. Uh, lots of people are making optimizations to them. Alexi posted some optimizations to one of the most popular ones uh, maybe two weeks ago. So lots of things are happening. Uh, it's exciting. Um, and XDP, sort of to think about what that is. So it's, again, a, an extension of eBPF to run directly uh, like within a NIC. Um, the idea is to operate before the SKB is allocated. Not always the case, depending on how your, your driver is implemented. Um, but there's three key results that we think about with XDP today. So drop, transmit, either with or without modification, depending on what your BPF program does, and then um, pass back to the kernel stack for, for continued processing. Yeah, and one, one of the points is, is programmable. So that's, we allow the, the users to, to add a small program all the way down in the, in the, in the driver, and that's, that creates incredible flexibility. That's right. All right, so if you want to get started, uh, here are sort of the, the things to think about. Clearly, you start to look at these numbers for kernel versions and realize this is pretty new. Um, XDP in 4.8. Um, you know, Mellanox added support in 4.8 um, and 4.9 for two different drivers, uh, QLogic Cavium in 4.10, Verdionet in 4.10, Netronome in 4.10, and Broadcom BNXTEN uh, added in 4.11. So pretty new stuff. So you've got to have some, some comfort running an upstream kernel. Uh, or um, if you have the opportunity, um, Fedora 25, I think some of the, the, I think there's a good chance that the next, um, the next version of Ubuntu that, that's coming out very soon, uh, I, I didn't check, um, should work. Other requirements if you're rolling your own? I Jay confirmed. Okay, we talked before. And thanks. So Fedora 25 or uh, 17? 1610, thank you. Um, will both work, so that's a good start. Uh, you don't have to roll your own. Um, I have built LLVM and Clang. It's not that hard. They're great instructions. Uh, nonetheless, uh, it's easier if you can get, to get started with something like this if you've got a good base. 
All right, the other thing to think about is there's sort of three uh, samples that are out there right now in the kernel tree in samples BPF. Uh, these are great things to you know, have some familiarity with before you get started. It uh, gives you just a good head start. So XDP1, really simple, just drops all the frames that come in, has a nice counter that prints on the screen while you're running it. Um, XDP2 just swaps the source and desk MAC addresses and retransmits on the same interface. Um, again, these are not amazing, amazing things, but it's great to s see how this works, and you should have some familiarity before you get going. Then XDP TXIP tunnel, which is a little more complicated, uh, matches the source and destination IP that you specify, does some in cap, and retransmits. Uh, yeah, it, that's, that, that one's basically a sample of what Facebook is doing for, for the load balancing. There you go. So, so these are good, good things to get started with. You don't have to write your own program if you want to run this and test it on any NIC that supports it, or if you're doing the development on a new NIC, uh, you can use those. Um, other thing to think about is how the, these are broken down, because this is kind of the same model we followed with ours. Um, you end up with the eBPF code and map definitions in a file that's just underscore kern.c. In this case, I just referenced it as foo. Uh, and the output of that is um, created by LLVM and Clang, and you end up with a foo underscore kern.o. Uh, the cool thing about this is it's pretty portable. Uh, it doesn't contain any, shouldn't contain any code that's native to your, uh, your architecture. So example, I can compile I can make foocurn.o on an x86 and actually move that file, just that file, directly over to an ARM system if I want. And as long as I've compiled the supporting user space code, um, which ECC native to that architecture, uh, it just works. It's kind of neat. Um, unsurprising when you start breaking down the file to see what it looks like. Um, so, uh, and the user space code that does most of the loading, maybe does some map interaction, statistics, statistics gathering, it's a tough word to say apparently, um, is all in uh, foouser.o and ultimately compiled, uh, in this case, in the kernel, to something that would just be called foo. So for those that are visual learners, I uh, managed to find a nice uh, graphic stolen from somewhere else. And uh, you can sort of see how this interaction happens. Um, foouser has, I think I have some cool sort of laser pointer here. Um, yeah, so the eBPF code contains the byte code and the maps, and what we end up with is user space code reads and interacts with these maps. User space code also lo was the original loader of this code, and uh, this part we'll just ignore because that was just something else. I just didn't blank it out of the, the slide. Um, but this kind of gives you a picture of where things live. So eBPF, uh, byte code and maps, all, all inside you know, the, the ultimately originally in foocurn.o, loaded by user space, user space interacts. Seems pretty straightforward. Um, although it's amazing how long it takes to sort of get a grasp of how this all works uh, the first time you're, you're exposed to it. All right, so enough talking. Uh, let's see how this thing actually works. Um, so we, as I mentioned, kind of a similar split. It's what we had before. Um, Kern.c, map definitions, restricted eBPF, restricted C, that'll be compiled into the bytecode. User, the user space code that, that actually loads it. Now in our case, the differentiator between the existing XDP programs is this one loads and exits, goes away. Yeah, and, and that, that program has to be run as root. That's right. To, to be able to load the program, but what we did is there's also the, the command line version, and that actually can be run as, as, as a normal user, and the whole trick is that I only need to interact with, the, with these maps. After loading the program, I only need to interact with the BPF maps. And they get exported to the file system, and it is really simple. I, I change the owner of the file. And then, <laughs> then I can actually interact with, as, a, as a normal user. So that's a parameter you give to the, the program runs as root, what, what you want to change the, the, the file, the, the owner of the file into, and afterwards you can run as that root, or as that user, with the command line tool and interact with BPF as a normal user. So that's like a split security model as, as, as we always known it from, from Unix, right? All right, so, uh, so let's kind of dive into this a little bit. Uh, oh, and obviously the command line code, as Jesper said, it, uh, you know, it does nice interactions uh, with the sysfs files that we've linked back to BPF maps. We had to add something that was confusing. So, all right, of course, standard disclaimer applies here. Uh, You'll probably notice bugs. I wish I had some like swag to throw at people. I thought maybe throwing chips at people would be a bad idea and dangerous in this environment. So I didn't bring any to give out and throw at people. But um, yeah, let's take a look. 
All right, so we'll kind of break down the files and just talk about the different functions that are in each, and I can look at either screen. Um, so the things to think about that are significant, I tried to highlight. Um, this is the initial map definition. Uh, I don't want to go through the entire man page, so I'm not going to go over all the different options that are available for your map type. Um, in our case, uh, what we can indicate that we chose was a per CPU hash. So it's a hash list per CPU. Unsurprising, there's a copy of it on each CPU. Uh, that's cool because that means you can access it on your CPU. Uh, so if you want to have, in our case, our um, key value store, it, the value is a drop counter. We want to be able to access those drop, that drop counter without doing any locking, without doing any synchronization. So we end up with a per CPU hash. When yeah. you, go ahead if you want. Yeah, and this, the, 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 the key size is like 32 uh, uh, bit. And that's the, our, our input here is this, that's the IP address. That's, that's where we store the IP address. That's right. IP address is our key. And, and the, the, the value is just a counter for how many drops we are, we are seeing there. That's right. So there's a, there's a variety of, oops, sorry, there's a variety of uh, different map types available. Uh, like I said, in this case, the per CPU hash seemed like a good choice um, because our, we want to optimize for reading and writing while packets are coming in. That's our hot path. We don't want to optimize for, we could do a, just a, a type hash that's not per CPU, but then we'd have to deal with the synchronization across all CPUs whenever updating the counters. And we just, just didn't want to do that. Um, so it's kind of good to think about, right, what's going to be. I think we have some examples that because you have the per CPU thing, we put a little bit more stress on how user space have to interact with that. That's right. We put the burden on user space. We figure we're polling a lot less. I mean, as you saw, we were processing five or six million packets per second. I'm not, not polling. I'm not checking the stats five or six million times per second. So yeah. So, uh, so user space have because it's per CPU, it will actually have ha, has has to do the the, the summing of, of per right. CPU. So user space will see the counters per CPU, and it has to do some of these counters. So, so it's, instead of having yeah, so it's a balance where where you put the, the complexity and we, the fast path is in the kernel. So that's right. There we go. So the other thing is every BPF map that you define, I highlighted uh, online. Oh, um, well, that's not good. Uh, <laughs> there we go. Much better. Short presentation. Uh, so on line one, you can also see that I just uh, I labeled a section there um, that, that it's a map. If you have multiple maps like this, you can still just call it section maps. Um, so this doesn't need to change at all. Uh, this is sort of some of the dark art that currently exists with some of the, the, the BPF programming. It's not a problem. It's just a, this is just how it is today. I mean, this is a new technology. It's emerging. Um, yeah, it's, it, the, the, the section is a little bit dark magic, so what happens right. is that this, this just helps when generating the, the, the output file, the, 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 That's elf, right. the ELF binary file, to make it recognizable later for the loader. All right, so we've got our map created. So we've talked about for the IP address case, this is going to be our key value store. All right, so the next thing we do is we have to create a function that the kernel is going to call. Uh, and this is the function that... Um, it will sit there and be ready when we attach an XDP program to an interface. Uh, um, and it's really pretty simple. Uh, line one, you can see there, um, we just define, again, a section. You can put any string in there you want. Um, I put uh, several other words in there just for testing earlier and um, had to change it for the purposes of this slide. Um, but just to find that section, it just sort of works. It's good. Um, I don't know if there's an interest in, in changing the way that that's uh, instantiated later, but that's key. You just got to do it. Um, another couple things to look at. Uh, line 7, a highlighted L3 offset. Uh, in the case where we're, we have a VLAN tagged frame or a multiple VLAN tagged frame or, or other things, you'd obviously want to think about um, once you about parsing that. So we've got a parse ETH function. It's going to return the L3 offset. So it's a, something to consider. And we've got a function handle ETH protocol. I'll go into each one of these. Um, one of the really cool things also uh, to think about if you look at line six is that because we're sort of in the kernel tree and we're including kernel files, we can actually just use all the existing kernel structures or many of the existing kernel structures for things. So you don't have to go reinvent an entire new set of structures. It's like, hey, struct ETH header, that's there. Um, let's use it. And we'll show you how to use it because you have to be careful. Uh, but this is great. Like, we don't have to reinvent everything. If you were writing a, a standalone application with, I don't know, some other interface that had user space pull mode drivers for something, for example, that was high performance networking, uh, you might have to, you know, write your own structures for everything. You don't have to do that here. Um, all right, so we're going to start parsing the packets. So this is our parse ETH function. Um, 
What I want to highlight, it was actually already touched upon yesterday uh, with the presentation from Facebook, but it's important to highlight again. Um, part of what BPF does, there's a verifier that checks to make sure you're following the rules. Uh, um, line nine is key. If you want to access something in that new structure you created, you have to double check that you have space to do it. So in the first function we had, I should have mentioned this, um, line four and five, we pass a data pointer on line five and a data end uh, spot in line four. So what we have to do each time we access any data is double check. Do we have space to do this? Uh, or else what happens if you forget this that is that when you load it into the kernel, the kernel will reject your program and say, oh, right. you didn't do your boundary checks. So that's actually a nice feature that you actually get slapped that's uh, right. around there. Yeah, it's a huge splat you get on the screen. And, you, and the first time you see it, you're like, what does that even mean? You start digging into it. You wonder if you should just call Daniel Borkman. Uh, you decide, no, I'm not going to waste his time. Also, he's probably asleep right now. And so you just go ahead and um, you dig into it and realize, oh, I didn't check my pointer. So um, everyone will probably make that mistake at some point or another when writing a, a packet parsing program here in, uh, in BPF. Um, so important, important to point out. Um, so uh, the next thing we do is have this handle eth protocol function. Um, and again, we just check the, check the protocol. Some cases, v6, ARP, we don't care. Default, also don't care. Um, and it, but if it's IPv4, since we've got a blacklist for IPv4, and we're maintaining that, let's go ahead and check it out. Pass in our data, data end pointers again, and our L3 offset, and off we will go. Um, you'll notice in several cases, we're seeing this return XDP pass you know, in two spots here. So basically, if we can't figure out what the packet is, just let it through. Um, maybe not the best idea, but you have to be practical about it uh, in our case. And that's the return code that the kernel is going to receive. So your, your net driver or anything else is going to see that exact return code, because that's the end. Yeah, and our code here is obviously much more verbose than it has to be, but we just included this to show that it would be really easy to do a switch statement, but most of this basically compiles out, right? Right. All right. All right, so here's our parse IPv4. So once again, you can see on line six, we could take advantage of cool kernel structures that are already there, not a whole lot of extra effort. Um, and again, on line 10, you can see once more time, we use some cool uh, pointer arithmetic there and uh, just double check that we have the ability to access that data. Um, yeah, I, I just want to mention that, and that, that trick with just plus one is, is just because you know C, right? <laughs> it, is, just the, it is when you do plus one, it's the size of the struct that you're actually moving. Right. A lot of people that don't read, read C daily maybe not catch that. Right? There you go, Th yeah, thank you. Um, excellent point. All right, so now here's where the rubber meets the road and where things get interesting on line 14. So this is where we actually, our first call into our BPF map to see if something's there. So we just call BPF map lookup element and we pass it, surprise, surprise, uh, the address of our, our blacklist, what we created. And what, what are we passing it? Our IP source that we computed on line 12. And what's going to return is a pointer and a value. And so in our case, um, if the value is valid, then we know there's an entry there. Uh, in the case of a, of a BPF hash map, um, only valid entries are populated. So if this were an array, for example, uh, value would always return something because arrays are pre-populated with zero values. So in our case, because this is a hash, we can write the code one way. For an array, we'd write it a little bit differently. Um, we'd actually probably do a if value, um, well, it depends on what you're storing there. In an array, you might, you might store a counter, you might store something else. Um, but either way, uh, we just increment it. So this is a, a cool thing, again, right here. We mentioned that per CPU hashes, you don't need to do any protection. So when we're doing this value plus one, um, this is only the value that's stored in the hash map on our currently running CPU. Yeah, this and is and not. And, and it is it's completely safe because we're running in, in NAPI context, and we're actually running with SU disabled also. That's right. So uh, we, on the read side. Right. We can feel pretty confident. 100% confident, I guess. Maybe not. You never know. There's always a room for some, some failure. But uh, no, we don't have to do any sort of uh, locking there. Does that's it? right. It's just, it works. So that's kind of cool. That's an optimization that, we, that, that was chosen for this. All right. So now we're to the point where we're going to return XTP drop because this one got a hit. And that's pretty much it. Like, the programs aren't complicated. They're not long. I mean, this is... I don't even remember how, how, long the, how long it is. Um, I probably could have put the real line numbers in, but it was easier to not, not do that for the purpose of this demonstration. Um, but it's pretty short code. So really, the keys for your kernel file 
the, the file that's going to be loaded as your, EP, as your eBPF program. You define a blacklist. You write a function that's going to receive your frames. If you want to, you track whether or not the frame was good. And, uh, and if you want to keep some stats, like I said, you don't have to keep stats, but it seems like kind of a good idea if you want to know what your program's doing. Um, and you report the decision back. What did we do with it? I mean, that's the whole point of all this is, yeah. you know, make, doing something. Yeah, that just want to mention. So one of the key concepts is that with, with XTP, you only write the exact code you need to solve your use case. And then you load that. That means that you only add the simple instructions that you need. This is, this is key to, to some of the performance gain we are seeing, because I have a very specific use case. I want to match this blacklist. And I only add those that gets compiled down to these assembly instructions, which is much shorter than if I had to be generic and we have to have the generic parser. And so right. You don't want to find yourself probably in a you probably don't want to find yourself in a situation where you're like rewriting, you know, all of NetFilter in XDP because you want to have this this amazingly uh, detailed ability. I mean, we it's not seen as a replacement. It's again early drop. We want to get get rid of these things early. Consume as little CPU as possible. Yeah, in the process. only add the instructions you need, right? Hmm? And only add the instructions re you really need. That's right. That's, that's, that's right. Only add what you need. Um, everything you need, nothing you want, I guess, um, was a joke I used to use about a car we had. Um, so, all right, so how's this actually attached to a net dev? That's the next question. Um, so, we'll go into blacklist user.c. Um, so, this is where a little bit of the, the sort of black magic exists right now. Um, and until you get into it and work with it, and again, I don't see that as a problem. It's just this is the way it is. And so you get into it. There's a BPF library in tools.libbpf, again, in the kernel tree. It's really helpful. Um, there's a couple variables that are set and are accessed, uh, especially in the examples, that until you drill down into it, you don't, you don't realize that that's, that's how it works. Um, so what we're going to do is typically, the other examples use load BPF file uh, to set, um, to, to load the program. I mean, it loads the BPF file. It's pretty, pretty self-explanatory. Excellently named function. Um, one of the two things that it does is it loads program D. So all the entries um, for all the programs you have that were in that file are populated in that array, and then map FD uh, aligns the maps. So there's a little bit of manual work that has to happen. That's, you need to yeah. That's that's the only like really bit annoying part that that these these map files the, the, the descriptors they are they, they will be in the order you define that in in, in the that's in right the, and underscore kernel dot C file. That's, that's the only thing you, you have, so, to have to align between right. these two. In our case, uh, in the first, our, our blacklist, since if it was the first entry, the first section, map section that was defined, it would be map FD0, flat out. But if, but if you have multiple, multiple maps, you're going to have to manually sort of look over and say, OK, well, that's 0, and that's 1, and count them off. No, when you access map FD, if you had something that, that it does it. So that's a little bit of the, the, the manual programming that goes with it right now. Um, now, the other, the other thing to think about is there are other ways to load files, uh, um, depending on how, what level of interaction you want to have with each of them, um, how many files you want to map to SysFS. There's some other ways to do this. Right now, for this, I think this was the easiest way to get going and have multiple maps. Uh, so again, um, we sort of talked about the same review, but here's the code in action. Um, so if once we've, once we've loaded, called load BPF map, um, we have prog FD0 should be set. If it's not, just exit, because we're in trouble. Um, in fact, one of the things that you'll find, uh, a case where this, won't, where this may fail, is if you try to build on one system and say, oh, this is great. I got my new app. I'm going to copy it over somewhere else. And the first time you SCP the file over to the new system, you forgot to bring kern.o. You're going to hit a failure like this, because you, you need that kern.o to actually do things. Um, an easy, an, an easy mistake to make, uh, one you'll hopefully not make too many times. But the next case is line six. Now you actually set that program as uh, and assign it to an inter inter interface index um, with the call set link XTPFD, which is a netlink call, um, loads the file, and you're off and running. Yeah, that, that goes into the kernel and, and attach this program directly to the, to the, to the, to the given receive queues. Uh, That's right. And, so, and, like, and, and the NIC. Literally, this is it. Like it's not. Yep. That's now we, we do some different things here because we're rather than having a program that loads it, runs it, and waits and prints state, prints interaction, uh, do a little bit of extra work. We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, uh, it's just as, as someone once said, it's just a small matter of programming. Um, so 
The other thing is talk about the importance of MAPFD, um, why we care about it. So again, all the, all the maps are loaded here. And unsurprisingly, thankfully, in user space, the calls to access these things are very similar. You may remember just a few minutes ago, we did a BPF map, map lookup element call. And that time, when we called it, we passed um, blacklist as the first argument. And then we passed key as the second argument, and it returned value. Well, in this case, now we're just going to pass the file descriptor associated with that map, pass in the key, and instead of being returned, the third argument is the value. So this is really cool because it's like, it's the same, a little confusing maybe because it's a different set of uh, parameters, but it's basically the same call. And it's just not a lot of work. And a lot of the difficulties are abstracted away. Um, it just, it works. It's nice. So kudos to the writers of Tools Lib BPF and, and the interactions between kernel and user space. So if you were doing, again, this is sort of the example, and this is straight from xcpuser.c. You load the file, check to see that it got loaded, um, set it up so you can hit Control C to exit. Um, on line 13, you can see we assign it to a net dev, and then we pretty much just pull the stats. And two, in this case, just indicates every two seconds. I think pull the stats. Sleep for two seconds, print the stats. So this is super easy. This user space implementation is not anything crazy. Um, if you didn't care about polling the stats, uh, you could actually probably take that, that kern.o and actually load it with IP route 2 And it would be up and running. You just wouldn't have the ability to really check to see what's being dropped very, very easily. Uh, it, in this, this case, it actually creates a map that, that we, we could export as a file oh, right. and then have a, a, a normal user space You're right. application polling this map. You could yeah, have a sysfs file that's pinned to it. Yep. So again, pretty, pretty easy stuff, but we want to provide a full example um, and talk about it. So yes, this is a slightly different implementation. So uh, Jesper actually did some of this work before, before I arrived, and uh, he actually split up load BPF file. Have, have you talked... Have you talked any more about? I'm not really happy about that. But with okay. The, we, we, we're going to change the API. We're going maybe going to to put this up and merge this into the to the kernel trees version. Okay. Of uh, of, of of load that that we load, load the file, because the the problem I hit, I hit was that when 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 I I'm just loading the file, it automatically loads all the maps and it, and it attaches uh, the file descriptors. But I wanted to, to reuse, so when I load my program, I want to, to see if there's already, already been exported of a file, and then I'll take that file descriptor, open that, and get that file descriptor instead of creating a new map. So it was just a way of splitting, so I could, that's, it's called re, <laughs> re, re, relocate mat, maps and attach. So I had to split that out in the function so I could right. modify the maps before it, the, the program get loaded. For me, this was the, like, as, when I came in to, this code base, this was the first part that I looked at and was like, oh, this is a little different. Like, I like it. And it really gave me uh, a greater, a little bit greater knowledge of some of the internals and how things work. So if you're looking at, if you, ultimately, if you clone the code and take a look at it, uh, this is a little bit different. I think it's a pretty good example. But like you said, that API is probably going to, that may change a little bit uh, yeah. over time. Uh, so the, the, the tricky part here is what you actually have to do with some of the details is that that you have your, your your BPF program, and you have to actually you have to go in and modify the BPF programs to to and point it point it to what 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 file descriptors these maps are being used, and that that helps the kernel to figure out what what maps it actually should use. So that that has to happen when when we load load, load the program. So that's that's a bit of a bit of a hassle, but it's been sort of hidden in the program. So what recently got added was maps and maps, so you can have you could you could do a lookup in the kernel to get what map it is, so you, you can dynamically add maps. So this, what this shows is that we've sort of statically, when we load the, pro the program, we statically say what, what maps ex exist and what you, you can access. But the reason adding addition of a, a, a new type of, of map that has maps, then that opens up the possibility that you could actually dynamically uh, create maps afterwards. So. But it, that's, that hits, like, is, that's really, really uh, right. uh, recent. Uh, Martin did those patches. Uh, yeah. So, uh, right. So this is, again, a slightly different implementation. But uh, the example's here. You can look at it. You can use it if you'd like. Uh, all right. OK, so when, when blacklist user exits, 
what we can say for sure is that all the VPF maps that we had uh, are created. They're all pinned to new files in sysfsbpf, so you could actually go look at those. And as and Jesper pointed out, you can go ahead. You can you can chmod those or chone those. You can do whatever you want, so yeah. that average average user, uh, non-root user. Uh, in fact, if you have an application that's going to feed data in, you don't want that application to run as root. You could change the ownership to be uh, that that application's, uh, however that whatever user that application runs as. Um, and then uh, later, when the command line tools come in, you know anybody with the proper permissions can can do that. Um, yeah, and and and, and this. This trick here is you actually have to remember to mount, right? Mount, mount a, the, a, a new type of file system called a BPF. But we 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 were so anticipating, so you just run our program, and it says, "Oh, you forgot to mount this," and we'll give you the mount command. So you just copy paste that. So it's very user friendly. So we very try to make it very really user friendly, even <laughs> a command line user friendly, because we don't know how to do UI. So. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, so. Uh, so now, when we're done here, our EPPF program is attached to the NetDev. It's up and running. Uh, may or may not be filtering any packets. Actually, it probably shouldn't be. That's the hope. Uh, just supposed to be there waiting for, waiting for commands. So now, this is where uh, we start configuring things. So this is our command line interface, uh, appropriately named command line.c. Uh, also, there's a common one. So uh, we had to support at the very beginning to put a couple entries in there just for testing to make sure our program is not completely uh, not working, um, and uh, so that's why some of the, the modify functions for modifying and adding entries to the map are, uh, are also in this common.h. So we'll kind of go over a couple of the things that are there. All right, so real basic, uh, you know, print the, print the entries that are there, add and delete entries, add or delete TCP and UDP ports from the blacklist, and uh, for fun, uh, print real-time XDP verdict stats. So the real-time printing is just a, a literal um, is the first, I think that first, the second UI that I showed it was just how many packets per second are we dropping, how many are we accepting, uh, how many aborts are happening. Yeah, and, and transmits out again. Right. But and we, we, we don't have transmits, any, but we don't have any of those. We just covered all the No, right now we're not yeah, right now we're not doing we're not doing transmit with this. Uh, just just for DDoS protection. Yeah, but you should be able to see we also counter aborts if some kind of strange traffic. We have a couple of aborts. It's right. Right. Aborts as well. Just, just, so, just so you can see the difference if the program is failing or dropping right. it because it wants to drop it, but because it was a malform packet. All right, so um, this is a small amount of code. It probably doesn't need its own slide, but we added it anyway. Um, so in our case, really pretty simple. We're opening up this BPF map associated with file blacklist. Coincidentally, file blacklist is, is also um, a string that it happens to be the sysfs file that we mapped to our blacklist map. That's how this all sort of works together. Uh, and what we're going to do is, in this case, we're just going to read the entries. We're going to print all the IPv4 addresses. So uh, in our case, we're going to call BPF object get on the file. Uh, through the magic of the BPF syscall and the kernel's storage of this information, we're going to be returned a file descriptor associated with that. Um, this is a pretty simple function, but we just put this here to, I think, make, really just make the, the other code easier to read. And yeah. So uh, you might question why, why, why this needs its own function, but it does. I think it makes it cleaner. Now we print all the addresses. So here's, uh, here's some map interactions. So in our case, we're um, setting our initial key to zero. Uh, there's this cool function. Um, this works well for both um, arrays and hashes, so that's nice. But you get the next key. So you pass it in a file descriptor, a key in the next key, and you're off and rolling. Um, anytime it returns, it's going to return a valid key. Key point to think about, if this is an array, every key is valid. So you're going to get back a lot of entries that basically have nothing in them. So if you have an array, you've got to come up with a way to note that nothing in, you know, that it's empty, um, either it's zero, sometimes that's a good thing, or um, has no value set uh, in any way. So, in our case, uh, this is a hash, so it's only going to return valid entries. In the case of my first example, I believe there have only been two entries that are returned because there were just two IP addresses specified. So the other thing is we've written a function called get key 32 value 64 per CPU, which is a mouthful, but it's pretty in appropriate for what the, what the function is. So we're passing in a 32-bit key, 32 bit key. We're going to return a 64-bit value. So hard, it's, I can't it's, even it's, say it. It's, it's just hiding the fact that we have to, to do the summing of, uh, of That's right. the values. So here is that function. Um, pretty, 
pretty straightforward. We're going to get the number of CPUs on line three. And we're going to go through, and on line eight, you're going to see that we actually look up. So here's our user space call, again, called the same as, as what we had in, in uh, kern.c, BPF map lookup element. We're going to pass it a file descriptor, because that's the file descriptor that we have passed in that matches the blacklist. We're going to check the key, and we're going to get the values. You'll notice that values on line four is a U64 that's equal to the number of CPUs in array size. So what it's going to do is it's going to return an array, and that's going to, interestingly, if we wanted to know which CPU was doing the drop for this particular blacklist, we could actually inspect that. Yeah, yeah we could. Um, we cared not that much about it. We just wanted to know how many times it was actually dropped. We weren't too worried about which, which queue received it or which CPU handled it. And then we just sum the values. So just take those. In, in our case, sometimes we ran this on a four-core system. On an eight-core system, did you have a 16-core? Uh, or just four or eight? You don't remember how many cores? I can't remember. I have different ones. A yeah, bunch of systems. Yes, we've got, yes, got a home lab. Uh, and so. Um, this was only eight, eight CPU. Only eight? OK, yeah. I don't think I tested more than eight either. But um, we're confident it works. Um, so just some of the value. I mean, this is like, it's really elementary. It's kind of funny to walk through. But, um, but we wanted to, again, wanted to provide an example. Want to have people you know, have the opportunity to see, see how this works. Um, so then the next thing we're going to do in our, in our order, if you remember, um, then we call blacklist print IPv4. Again, not, not terribly, uh, not, not rocket surgery, as some would say, um, but just really take our our 32-bit value, convert it back to a printable IP address, and uh, hopefully print out what we think is um, valid JSON for, uh, for this. Um, so nothing, nothing real crazy. So the, the, the real key interaction is actually just here in this get key 32 value 64 per CPU uh, function where we're looking up the elements, summing them because in our case we're using a per CPU hash moving yeah, forward. We, we thought that might be worth pointing out because that's something that I also, that, that got me that, oh, yeah. why, why am I not seeing all the values, right? Right, and the first time you do it, sometimes you'd, you'd see ports, you'd see things getting dropped, and you're like, oh, okay, that works. But then other times you send traffic, and you, you know, you're running eight windows, you got TCP dump running to see if the frames are coming in on the interface, see if they're getting dropped. You realize, they're getting dropped, but, but why is my counter incrementing? And it turns out it's because when you, you did the call, um, you only got value, you only got the one value for the one CPU you were on, or for CPU zero. So uh, an important yeah, and uh, also when you when you update the value, if you want to reset it to zero, you have to put in all the CPUs with zero. It's almost I like you know it, what the next slide is. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So in the next case, we're going to do the blacklist modify function. <laughs> um, so again, kind of similar. We're going to open the BPF map. You saw that that code earlier, so we won't uh, bore you with that since it's still the same. And we're going to call blacklist modify. So in this case. Um, right as Jesper said, right on time. Uh, line eight, we just do a mem set. We wipe out whatever was, we create an empty array before we get the element so that we know what we're getting back is correct and, and we can feel confident that it's actually being updated. Um, so in this case, uh, if the action in ours, our case is add, we're going to update it by um, updating. Um, yeah, do we, so we actually, OK, so here's, here's where things get a little bit interesting. So with, if this were an array, I talked about it earlier. I think I've said it twice. So I'll say it a third time because it's worth remembering. Um, if this were an array and we were adding something in, all the, array, the arrays are initialized to 0 to start with. So in our case, because it's a hash and it's not initialized to 0 to start with, we can actually write 0 in there. And that creates this initial value. That creates the initial entry in, in the hash. So we want our counter to be 0. It all makes sense. So we're actually, our add is just say, write zeros in at this key. And now we know that that's a key we want to block. And we know that values will be incremented as traffic comes in that should be blocked. Yeah. And, and we also have to check if it doesn't exist or else we would clear out the, our old, old entries, right? That's right. So we clear out our statistics values. Right. Um, so and then if our action is delete, um, we just call delete the element because, again, this is um, I mean, that's what we're doing. It's easy. So we're just, we want to not have it there at all. Um, we want, if we, if we just cleared the value in values, the way our program is written, the way we wrote our BPF code, if we just cleared it, um, we would still drop, drop frames, because values is just the counter. Um, so it's pretty simple. Um, you do have to know some about the nuances of the map elements, um, or the, the map types, uh, in order to write this correctly. But, the cool thing is a lot of the APIs are the same. Um, I actually, when I implemented the port blocking, 
uh, for, for TCP and UDP ports. Uh, my first implementation was just using a hash, just like, let's just get it working. Let's not think too much about uh, getting it complex. Um, and, you know, you can, when I switch to an array, you still use all the same calls. You just have to know that slight difference between what the return values are uh, and how they interact. All right, so now we've, we've added one, we've deleted one. Uh, I, actually, I think I forgot to update the title on that. So um, now we'll go with a little bit of usage. Um, how does this thing work? What does it look like when it runs? So here's us um, initializing uh, the application. We're attaching it to a device. Um, we have gone all the way to being able to specify the name of the net dev instead of just the IF index on the command line. Yeah. I feel like this is like just light years ahead of other things that are out there. <laughs> um, thank you for the mild laughter. Um, uh, <laughs> and, and here we get a nice printout of all the blacklist, um, map, all, the, all the maps that we're using. Um, the one we talked about uh, today and went into detail is on line 10 there. This is the DDoS blacklist. This is the file. Um, again, this is where the, the printout is done that you put in there. If, if sysfsbpf is not, is not mounted, um, the program yeah. won't start. We'll actually complain and say something. It, this, That's right. This, this also have a quiet option, but the default is that it actually tells you a lot about what's going on. That they, see, this is the files. This is because this is an example program. So yeah. you really want to, to like point out what this is doing when you call it. You can also call it with a quiet option, and as standard Unix, it doesn't but say anything. Neither one of us are very quiet, so that didn't seem appealing to demonstrate. Um, <laughs> so, the other thing that's cool, um, I decided on line 16 to demonstrate the fact that the latest IP Route 2 um, also prints, um, not typically highlighted in yellow, um, and hopefully this is good for all folks that are red, green, colorblind. Um, I don't know if people can see that color. Um, that XDP is currently attached. So, uh, this would be another reason to upgrade to a pretty modern distro or make sure you're running the latest IP Route 2. Um, so, while you can't explicitly check to see what BPF is program is running right now or what happens in that BPF program, you can know that, um, that XCP is attached to an interface. So um, that's kind of convenient if, you, if you're debugging something. Um, all right. So blacklist configuration. Again, not that epic. Um, you're really just adding an IP address, deleting IP addresses. You can I can see we've got to remove the debug output with the key. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah. you know, it's, uh, we can add, we can, it, patches accepted. Um, no, uh, yeah, we have to get, get rid of some of that debug output. Um, I don't know if you added that or I added that, but anyway. Um, this is a good, it's a good canary to let you know that yeah. things are happening correctly. Yeah. Um, now, uh, now, and now, now you are, you're, you're actually 10, 10, you added 10, 10, 10, or else you could actually see the keyboard would be in the network byte order, but it's. Yeah, well, that's sort of intentional. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> so the other thing is we thought about, all right, neither one of us, uh, or at least I won't speak for Jesper, but I don't maintain a lot of uh, websites that are um, highly targeted by anybody. Um, but I thought about what if we wanted to automate this? How could we do this? So it seems like uh, back when I did run something, deny hosts seemed to be cool, um, or at least non-terrible. Um, and it seems like the spiritual successor to that is like fail to ban. So I thought, all right, well, how easy is it to automate this? Um, and so I quickly forked it, and um, it was really trivial. Uh, so congrats on the, to the fail to ban folks for making it so easy to use, in all honesty. Um, and there's just an example of what it would take to take this application and allow, your, allow you to uh, you know, look at all the different SSH or other um, protocols that you enable, other log files you enable, and add these to, the, to a blacklist, uh, BPF blacklist automatically. Um, All right, so now we'll talk a little bit about performance, because uh, that's why, that's the real reason to use XDP. So we've got a couple, couple charts on that. So you want to talk about this yeah, one? Yeah, this, this is run on my system. So this, this is, uh, I'm, I'm just running a single UDP stream, so uh, what, what this test is really showing is, is a, I only activate a single CPU. So if, if I want to just send, if I'm just sending a lot of packets, UDP packets to the same port, then, and I have no lis listener, I think the kernel is driving with, 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 with around 3 million packets per second. Uh, and this is after commit something, because that's important. Before, we had like half performance. Uh, uh, but if, if we then don't go and look at what's, what is the earliest possible point we could, we could drop with like IP tables, 
that's like in a, we have a table called raw, and in a pre-routing step, I'm adding uh, a match uh, for for port nine, which is the the, the ports I'm attacking with a, a packet gen. And what we see there is that the base performance is, is 4.5 million packets per second we can drop. And then we did the same test with the blacklist, and I can drop uh, uh, 9.6 million packets per second. And this this is mostly actually because I get a cache uh, cache hit. Right. This it's is actually not because of the so much because of the hash. Can, can you next time? Can you try with dropping a TC ingress? You know, you want Wait, who asked that? Yeah, my, <laughs> Try, try. When you get another chance again, try to do dropping a TC ingress. I'm just curious. Just the action drop, simple. Yeah. In software or not? No. In software. Yeah, and, and NFT ingress, please. NFT. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, I actually, I actually have a, a, a test script that, that that can drop that in in, in TC because that's Jamal asked for that. I have a small intervention. That's very really nice. Uh, of you doing all this stuff. We detect one bug on your XDP program because you are using U64 bit uh, counters, but uh, it won't work on a 32 bit kernel, right? Yeah. It's because when you fetch the values from U space, there is no way you can fetch the automatically this 64 bit value. But that's a minor point. But yeah, okay, so there's a bug in your XDP program. Just I guarantee you so, that's so, not so, the only you one. Know. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Thank you, thank you, Eric. We are we are accepting your patches. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. And this was this was also like completely like un, I mean, this is completely untuned, unhacked drivers. I mean, very like vanilla. Yeah. This should be something that if you ha if you happen to have a CX4 card, you could reproduce. Um, we hope yeah, pretty pretty yeah, easily. Definitely. That's. And yeah, as, as I said, if, if I actually have some patches, we'll, we'll change this number to like 17 million packages per second in the blacklist drop. Right. But it, that's, uh, so uh, then Jesper ran another one. Yeah, um, so we do scaling testing to see it doesn't, doesn't help much if it, it was just like it, if this stuff didn't scale, right? So we did like I had, because there were seven CPUs in my machine, uh, or eight CPUs in my, machi my machine, I, had, I created like seven flows. Uh, of, 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 and then have one flow being ex accepted with XDP pass, and the other flows like just attacking. I, and as you can see, I'm I'm dropping like 30 million packets per second, and and we are passing through what what the kernel can handle. In this case, it's it's, it's 3.4 million packets per second because that's I'm just sending it to a UDP port that where there's no no listener, and, and the the kernel just drops that. That was basically the other number from before, that. That's that's what what happens when when you send it to the network stack. The, the the performance does drop if I do intermixed traffic because now I'm just keeping these flows, but that I'm working on fixing that. Right, and this is again early early phase of things. I think um, it'd be I better if we had some nice perf output to. It's, you it's know. a pretty good number. Right, being able to DDoS protection with uh, 30 million packets per second. That's Did you do you have a question? I'll repeat it. Yeah, so so XDP is, is not magic. So if <laughs> if 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 you actually if you uh, it's, it's a really good question. So if you just do XDP pass, if your your primary con like use case is you, you just load a program to XDP pass, the number of cycles you added in the hot path is going to affect your, your performance. So you do see a uh, degradation like maybe 10% or something if it's really bad. That, 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 that you actually lose performance by loading this program for, okay. for doing Can I follow XDP up? Yes. When you did your tests with IP, IP tables, did you have XDP loaded already? Uh, no, it was not loaded. XDP was not loaded when I did the IP tables test because then. Uh, That's right. Yeah. Abs absolutely. That's a, gr that's a great point. I mean, the cycle spent processing these frames to check as to whether or not they're acceptable. Yeah, but I'm, no, I'm not fair. Uh, that I, I've made sure that the XDP program is not running. Of course, right. adding whatever instruction in the hot path is going to, to count down for delivery into normal use space. But that's, that's the trade-off you're, you're choosing when you load the XDP program. If you want to, to filter some certain kind of traffic, you can do that. But 
it, it comes at the performance cost for delivering the normal stack, and that's something people should be aware of. It's not, not a magic thing. So there is a second thing I wanted to say. Uh, it's about IPv4. What about IPv6, guys? <laughs> We well, have, we, we, have, we have a slide for that. Yeah, we, we have a slide <laughs> well, on that. That's next. Andy wanted to implement it. Yeah, it's yeah, really came down to time. I mean, because we know that, that, especially in a lot of the data centers, right, IPv6 is what's happening. People are not doing IPv4 really anywhere much. Um, so we also want to target to think about like home users. So the next slide kind of, I actually tested this on a, a quad core A57. Um, surprise, surprise that my company makes. Um, and uh, because BNXTEN supports uh, XDP, uh, did some similar testing. Yeah, um, but this, this is an ARM CPU because you Right. Uh, and so in this case, we're able to, with a single stream, drop 3.7 million. Um, I know from talking to other people that there exists the capability to drop at a much higher rate, especially if things are tweaked. So that's going to be the, the sort of next action for me is to work on that. Um, disappointed there are pictures of it, but that's OK. Um, so. Uh, but yeah, we feel like IPv6 is the way to go. There's going to be a much bigger hit um, going in, looking that far into the packet. But that's okay. Um, that'll, that'll be next in the uh, in the pipeline. Um, so, all right. So a couple tips and tricks that we encountered. Uh, wanted to save you some time uh, if you're writing your own um, or if you're trying to use this. Um, so the first one is to turn on the in kernel uh, in kernel JIT for BPF. So um, it makes a huge difference. Huge, huge difference. Um, thank, thank you, Eric. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Um, so the first time I did some testing, I was like, well, this is pretty disappointing. I'm not sure this is going to be a technology that's worth using. And um, I realized once I turned it on, I was like, whoa. I mean, it's, you're talking about pretty close to double the performance in a lot of cases. Um, and the deeper, the bigger your program is, the, the greater the gain is. So um, if you have a simple program that's doing, not, like XDP1 is probably not going to notice a huge change in performance. Um, especially if you, yeah, you're really not going to notice much if, if, if it's not going in very far. Um, but the more BPF code you're running, the more this is critical. So uh, do this. Put this in, in your config files so it's on all the time. Um, so uh, yeah, again, huge performance gain. Um, the other thing is when you first start using some of these things, some of the programs don't have, depending on what shell you're using. Um, I tested this on Ubuntu. We tested this on Fedora. Um, did a little bit of testing on a Yocto-based uh, distribution, and the shell's going to have different U-limit settings. So you're going to want to run, you, you might try to run it the first time, you're going to get an error about memory limits or map size. Uh, so check, check U-limit-A and consider increasing your defaults. Um, so that's, that's key to think about uh, when getting started. Uh, the other thing is just to familiarize, familiarize yourself with the ability to dump out the maps. Um, both LLVM and ReadElf can do this. Uh, it gives you a chance to look at how big things are if you want, so you can see that in this case we have our XDP program is, is on line 11. Um, our maps are there. This, 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 this was just to demystify that the ELF file that's generated, you can actually use the standard like, right. like object dump debugging tool to look at this stuff. With, like in the newer LLVM, uh, Alexi is telling me that we, we can we can inline some of the original, original uh, C code, so, so we could actually, what I really wanted to show here was that we could like dump the assembler, and we, you would see something useful, but we are not doing it here because we will just show you BPF code. We really wanted to show in the Lua LLVM, you, we could dump and inline uh, some mm. of the C code so you can get a, get a feeling that, that I generated this and what did they, I, I can look at the assembler instruction just to demystify that this, this whole thing that just the L file and it's, it's magic. But right. You can actually look into it with standard tools. It's not, not that magic. And I, I had some issues, I think, initially when I, before maybe discovering the U-limit things that I, I mean, I was going, going through saying, like, really? Are, like, are the sections really there? Um, so it's always good to understand uh, what you're working with uh, whenever you can. Um, so uh, also talk a little bit about um, everybody's favorite debugging tool, uh, Print K, and what you can do while running in your program if you need to. Um, so there's, a, there's this BPF debug um, uh, piece that was added, and you can see in the comment here that Jesper so kindly put in there that you can, you can actually uh, just examine what's in the trace pipe file, and you can see things that happen. Uh, this was important when I was doing some initial 
initial work uh, to see what, what is going on. Um, but you, sh you shouldn't leave, leave this on for, for production use because it's, no, it's quite I'm heavily to, to call the, the BFF trace print K. And so we, we, we make it look from the C side, we, uh, with the restricted C, we make it look like it's, we have a print function, we, but we actually don't have that. Right. What we have is, is we can use the, the trace infrastructure to do this print K, and we actually have to re you remember it ends up in a file uh, that, that you have to, to list the but it's not. Off. The key is that it's not, so, that it's not so magical that you don't get any output at all. You get to see what's going on. You get to see what's happening uh, if, you, if you want to put that in there. Um, I think the line above this has like an undef debug or something, or, or the if debug yeah, exactly. one commented out. Um, all right, so uh, a couple of things that we could think about. Um, so if you wanted to make this a whitelist app instead, um, you. I believe you could run those three commands um, and recompile, and suddenly you'd have uh, a whitelist, um, a whitelist application. Uh, uh, so that would be kind of cool uh, if you were if if you decided like, hey, I just I need to check these these things. I want to keep my list short. You want to reduce the size of your hash map. All sorts of benefits to doing whitelisting. Um, if you want to blacklist an entire subnet, um, there's a new type for that. Uh, so thanks to Daniel Mack for implementing that. Um, I think it maybe went through a little bit of flux at the beginning, but I think it sounds it's pretty. It works now, maybe. Yeah, good now. I think the, the audience knows it better than us. That's right. So I'll just stop talking now. Uh, no, I won't. Um, so that would be pretty easy to add. Um, you know, again, new command line options, pretty simple. But I feel like there's an opportunity for growth with this or with other apps. Um, and then see right on time. I got it. IPv IPv6 blacklisting. Uh, that obviously is there. Um, you will like, accept patches for that? Yeah, we, we, we will. <laughs> so again, really simple, but. Um, yeah, we just ran out of time. We actually wanted to implement that as an example. Right, um, because we know, we know how useful that is. Um, all right, so maybe what's next? Uh, some of these features we talked about. Um, so one of the other things that we ran out of time to implement is um, the ability to keep the maps persistent so that uh, you have a consistent blacklist that's available and port yeah. blacklist. Right, right now we are reusing, reusing this, this map from, from and, and seeing it's already mounted at the file system, I'm going to, just going to open this and, and, right. and, and reuse that in my file system or in my BPF program. But, but this is actually not valid because if I change my BPF program uh, enough that I, I, I want to use another layout of the map, I, I fakely see that, oh, there's a map, I'm just going to take this map. And, and, and use that in my program, but it will actually have the, the invalid in, in layout because I, I changed my BPF program to actually use the map in a new way. That's then, right. Then I'm cheating myself, but uh, Daniel Bogman solved that uh, because you can actually open the file and you can, re you can read some of the information about the file. That you, so you, you, when you open the file descriptor, you, you can access some information about what, what map type it is, what the size of the uh, key and value is, and from that, you can deduct that I, I, I'm using this, this, this map here is, is the wrong size, so I, be, I better like create a new map or, or do something. Or right. Right, right to the user, you have to reload your whole program or something. And, and if you, you and, Daniel, could, and Daniel Bogman actually implemented this for, for IPv2, we just didn't have the time to like. Right, so we'll steal that code. And, uh, <laughs> so we know there's, there's a bug there, and <laughs> I, 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 I was wondering when we just wanted to have the slide, so Daniel didn't point it out. Well. <laughs> Um, so, and then the other maybe ability to have uh, like an import option. So, if you've already got a long list of things, uh, you know, add the ability to, to bring in a whole new, a whole bunch of entries at the same time. Um, you could merge it. You could do other things. Uh, that would be really nice if you had a fleet of machines and you were rolling up a new one and wanted to make sure they had the same lists everywhere or you know, a variety of things. Um, uh, the last one that, that um, I think is also interesting is to think about um, dividing up. Right now, uh, the code as it exists first parses IPv4, and then um, the last call as it parses the ports, uh, TCP UDP ports. I think it would be more compelling is to uh, you know, use tail calls and a, a map, an, an array of um, programs, and be able to say, be able to very clearly say, all right, look, I don't have anything in the port list, so don't scan it. Because that's one of the issues right now. We're, we're scanning every, every packet, even if we don't have anything in either one of those lists. Yeah, so um, there's, there's a lot of room for optimization. And right. some of the features are you could put it in a tail call because we're really optimizing the number of instructions we want to push, push into this really, really early code path. So, so what you're saying is that we, yeah. could, we could say if, if you don't use the, the, the port number function, 
we will put that into a separate BPF program and use the, the, the tail call for that. The reason for that is that then we actually don't have to load the, the, the instructions and, and, and put pressure on the instruction cache because we, we might never load this program. Right, and then you could also give you the chance to have like a, maybe more custom pipeline. Like if you felt like some things were important um, and some things weren't, uh, you could do that. So uh, who knows how far we'll take it. So I also have like a whole, an eye chart of references. Um, Man BPF, probably the most important one. Um, but no, this is really, we borrowed from a lot of, a lot of folks that have done things in the past, uh, looked at a lot of things. Um, there's a ton of resource online about this, and we wanted to just provide a, a real concrete example of how to write a program and uh, have hopefully, some of the people hopefully can use. Make, hopefully make it easier for people to get started. That's right. So they don't think this is all magic. That's it. Thank you very much. Demystifying. Yeah. <laughs>so another another question yeah um, you you brought up optimization there, and that that was like sort of an external optimization, right? Have you looked at all at how well LLVM optimizes your code like if you have a bunch of functions like what uh, Martin was showing yesterday, where they call a bunch of functions that all kind of do the same thing, does it go and does it really use the full optimizer can it actually uh, collapse all of these things? I would, I would like uh, Alexi to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Thought maybe you'd actually like, look uh, I, 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 no, I, I don't know. I, I, I wanted once, one of the reasons that you saw it, we used object dump because I wanted to look at the, the instructions and stuff like that. Right. But it, it turned out to be a little bit harder and had to have a newer version of LLVM and stuff to do. So I actually wanted to look at this stuff, but so I actually didn't have time to check it. I think the, the tool incompatibility, or not incompatibilities, but the, the newness from, for me, from an experience standpoint, of some of these tools made it hard to know. Like, it's sort of like my first step was like, did it actually work? Um, you know, and so I was like, all right, cool, it works. Maybe it's not perfectly optimal. Um, I'll, I'll point out too uh, that right now, uh, out of the box, ARM doesn't quite work. Um, there's a small patch needed. I tried to socialize it a little bit. There's some some inline assembly that's in uh, some of the the Arch, uh, the ARM Arch files that I'm hoping to get resolved pretty soon. So this works well. It's kind of a known problem, but it's. For me, personally, it's sort of like we can't, we can't demo this. We can't do this easily. Other people can't use it. Let's make it, make it easy to consume. So I'm hoping we'll get that resolved pretty quick. Um, and, and the distributions are catching up, right? Before, we had, you had to recompile LLVM. But now, actually, the, the versions in the, the standard distribution are starting to have versions of LLVM which supports this, and it, it works out of the box. And that's yeah. really great. There's some great, great improvements coming at that Alexa implemented in LLVM. And, right. and it will show up in the distribution, so you don't have to recompile the whole thing from scratch. It'll get easier. Hopefully, the enterprise ones will follow too, and, and everyone will be able to use yeah. it. Right. Any more questions? I don't think so. Jamal, no. any more questions? No. Uh, nothing from the hallway? You checked? <laughs> no, Sorry. I was just asking the hallway what's going on. <laughs> All right. That was live? Are we, are we going into the penalty box? No, I think, I, I'm just going to say, wrap it up. We're going to have an excellent keynote coming up. You, We're done. We're on an applause, guys.